Okay, today on the show, I'm joined by Paul Michael Glazer, actor, director, artist. How are you doing today, sir? I'm doing okay. I'm doing okay. It's another day. Another day. And what's what's life been like for you the last 18 months with all this pandemic and things? Has it affected your life in any way? Well, you know, uh, the last time I was in Ireland, which is, uh, I, I was in Dublin. We were doing a tour of the musical Fiddle on the Roof. I was playing Tevye. And during that tour, my daughter had said to me that I should be the one to illustrate my next book. So I started illustrating. And when I finished, I had not only a bunch of illustrations, but I had about 80 incomplete pieces of art. But I'd sketch when I get bored with my th- with doing illustrations. So I I discovered the good news was I discovered a way that I could disappear for six to eight hours and not depend on anybody to work with me creatively, you know, as an actor and as a director. And even though I'd been doing my writing, I was uh, you know I, so that was good news. I'd found that. The bad news was I had found a way to disappear for six to eight hours. Yeah which only enforced my uh, tendency towards Hermitage. So what did I do for the last 18 months? I wrote and I painted and I painted and I wrote. Yeah. And I uh, just kept it going. And uh, right now I'm just finishing up one of the 40, uh, 40 illustrations that I did as a, uh, uh, for the book. And uh, I'm editing the book right now. And, And when I come to the illustrations, I take a look at them. The only problem with that is that I've done the illustrations over the past 10 years. So that means that the earlier ones that I did don't benefit from whatever experience I accrued over the 10 years. So I look at these and I go, who did that? And then I have to repaint it. Okay, so you reckon that you've got better over the last 10 years and you look back. I got a little better. Uh, my son and everyone else convinced this, are convinced that I'll never finish this because I'm such a perfectionist. But I, I'm getting close, closer. Yeah. And just when you touched on Dublin there quickly, how did you get on in Dublin and where were you? Was it the Olympia Theatre? Uh, what's that theatre that is on a wharf uh, and it's a big corporate theatre? It's uh, The Board Gosh Theatre, I think. It might be that, yeah. I think uh, that, that sounds like what it was. That wasn't my favorite theater to play with, uh, play in, but uh, I love Ireland and I love being there. And, uh, you know, and that was that was my delight. And so, uh, you know, so I enjoyed that. We traveled all over. Okay. We only did, I think we only did one theater in Ireland. I'm not sure, but I think, I can't remember too well. Yeah. <laughs> You, you recently had a, a solo art exhibition over there in the States. Do you want to tell me how it went and what exactly was going on there? It was uh, an art exhibition. Uh, we'd wanted to, uh, to make it available, uh, my art, uh, as an event for a lot of my supporters. So we had a, uh, a, uh, uh, an invited event and then we opened it up later in the day to more people and it went very well the, the art hangs i'm very pleased with the way my art hangs on the walls so it, it, it uh, you know it does really uh looks really well um some of my art uh, uh is a uh, uh lends itself to being in a very very large format so if i wanted i could put it on the side of a building okay and uh, so uh, that's been interesting. I've been having meetings with people trying to, you know, find, uh, you know, what they, uh, what they would like. I actually went and took pictures on the internet of some buildings, just random buildings in Chicago that had a good wall surface. And then I photoshopped a bunch of my pieces up onto those. So that's kind of like my promo. I send that out to people, you know, and it works. It worked well. So yeah, the, the the gallery, the gallery went well. Uh, you know, I, I think I'm happiest when I'm home doing it. The 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 the, the PR side of it and the, 
market. Nuts and bolts. The nuts and bolts. Uh, I, I uh, I'm not great at. Is it true that you refer to your art as Act Three, and is that in relation to you being a an actor, then a director, and then an artist? Well, uh, you know that name came up. Uh, an acquaintance of mine suggested it, and so we used it at the time to say, "Well, this is Act Three. I don't refer to it that way anymore, but uh, it could easily be referred to that. It's Act Three of my life. Yeah. Would it, would think, would that be fair to say then that you're going to focus on that for the rest of your career over directing and TV? I have I have no idea what tomorrow will bring. Yeah. None. I have found that I mean I have as in terms of writing I have three two unfinished novels and an unfinished screenplay and I keep rotating them in my head when I go to sleep at night saying well tonight I'll think about this and I keep waiting to see which one is going to hook me yeah so that when I go back to but uh, I enjoy that I enjoy working with words and I enjoy the ideas of, uh, you know, because you can do so many layers when you create uh, as, as an author, as a writer. Um, and, and painting too. I mean, the primary way in which I relate to myself, including my acting and directing, is the storyteller. Yeah. By the way, storytelling in Ireland is, goes back thousands of years. I mean, that play, that's, you know, people are always saying to me, how is it that you get such great storytelling uh, in Europe? I said, well, look how old the place is. They've been doing it for a long time. And actually now in America, I find that storytelling is going by the wayside between the, uh, the people's fascination with instant gratification and the, uh, the internet and the shortening attention span. Yeah. And stories don't have such a strong foothold in our culture as they do in your culture, which is really a shame because if there is to be a demise of this society, that will be it. Yeah, your, Europe is a very diverse place, like full of history. Like every country you go to is totally different over here. Right, exactly, exactly, exactly. Yeah. What was your first creative love? Did you want to be an actor when you were young? Did you want to be a painter? Or did you just, did you want to do all those things? I think I wanted to do everything. I, <clears throat> my mother exposed me to an awful lot of uh, different uh, venues. And, uh, and then I have two older sisters and the middle one, the middle child, my second older sister, she uh, wanted ever so badly to be an actress. And so she was pursuing that for a while. And I think that had an influence on me. I, you know, I think that's the direction I went. Uh, and then, um, and then, I found I found uh, I enjoy acting. I enjoy acting very much. I, I talk about it as uh, uh, dancing on a bubble. You know, uh, Cary Grant, who by the way is an Irishman, I believe. Cary Grant was one of my heroes, and he did that. I and mean, he had a dance or a his timing was such, and I was always fascinated by that. Um, and then, um, you know, when I, when I worked more for camera, I became more fascinated with how quiet I could be in front of the camera, not not audio, so visually, how still. Um, but I, I, you know, when then I started doing uh, the series, and I realized that I didn't want to come to work every day and sit around for 12 and a half, 13, 14 hours and maybe go zero to 60 in about, you know, a dozen times. And the rest of the time you're sitting there twiddling your thumbs or you find some other things to do if you can, you know, like reading or whatever. So I, when I started filming, I discovered all the creative avenues of filming. I love photography, I love drawing, I love painting, I love writing. So it was like, and I would dance. And here I was moving the camera, I was photographing, and I was, uh, uh, I was doing it all. And I was using music, and I was putting it together, and I was 
it was it was uh, to me it was the most delightful uh, uh, experience in in uh, with the camera uh, and with the, with the creativity and show business. Uh, but the performing was always you know it's the stage thing, it's the active medium of the theater. Yeah, and. So I got to reprise, or I got to play Tevye and Fiddler on, on stage in the musical. It was the first musical. I mean, I'd done a couple of, uh, 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 what do you call them? Uh, uh, pantos. Yeah. Over there, but I hadn't done a serious musical. And so I got to do that. And I got to play Tevye, which was, for me was like falling off a log. And it was easy. And I, and I loved it. And it was... Uh, just that resonated with me on so many levels. And so, and I don't think since Starsky had I found a role that I liked that much, that yeah. gave me the, the latitude to do all the things I like to do so much, which is be silly, be sad, be angry, be, you know, the levels, the layers. Yeah. Um, and does the live audience help big time when you're doing something like that as well? I'm sorry? Does the live audience help like when you're doing the musical to? Yeah, when you're doing it, when, when the curtain goes up, it's you and the audience. No one's going to yell, cut, let's try it again, or any of that. And so it's kind of like, uh, I use a surfing analogy. You're kind of like surfing. And and it's all immediate. And people, and someone once said to me, they said, well, what's it like being on stage? I said, well, if you consider that we are talking, the two of us are talking back and forth. And if I say with any part of my being, in truth, honestly, no, it has to be a small part. I love you. Or you say it to me. We have our reaction to each other. Out there on the, in the audience, 1,500, 1,000, 800, however many people you want are out there. And they're reacting to the same energy. So you put it out, it comes back. So if you want to imagine that that flow of energy is kind of like waves and you're riding them. Because the audience is a very interesting, uh, uh, it's, a, it's both a, a dumb animal and a very wise creature. You know, it, 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 it knows when you're not telling the truth. Uh, the individual people may not know it, but the seat of their pants knows it. And, and so, you know, that's a very immediate, event acting on the stage mm -hmm. acting for the camera is a whole other ball game and it has more to do with uh uh really uh being present and now it's the same thing on stage you want to be present but somehow it's much more intimate there's not an audience it's the camera of the lens which will always tell if you're lying yeah um I used to have a habit when I did the series was the director would call roll, they call, you know, roll the camera, okay, and then he'd yell action. When he yelled action, I'd turn and look at the camera and I'd say, hi. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to get in touch with how I felt being photographed at that moment. Yeah. And that was my movement into, the, into what I was doing because I was present. And how did that go down when you had done that? Sometimes it worked really well. Sometimes it worked well. Sometimes I didn't have it together to own the amount of fear that I felt at the moment when I said hi. <laughs> like, how am I going to do this? <laughs> yeah. When you when you look back at Starsky and Hutch, obviously the time it came out and there was loads of iconic shows that were out around that time, and they've stood it stood the test of time. What do you think the main difference is between shows nowadays and shows back then? Well, we kind of touched on it, you know, storytelling. Yeah. I think the, the writing today, you know, it's interesting. If you go on the, on the internet uh, or you go on to any of the streaming channels and you look at the amount of, uh, of series television, uh, that would include streaming shows that come out of Europe and Africa and China and Japan, Korea, all of them. What's interesting is, is everybody has learned what we in America may have been a leader in, in terms of yeah. 
the technology of putting film together. Once they figured that out, their storytelling today is far better. Their characters are far more interesting. They weave things in and out. They keep you in suspense. They keep you intrigued. Whereas the American film industry and television industry is always aiming for that in terms of individual needs of writers and producers and actors. But by and large, it provides distraction, not inspiration. Yeah. There's a new, actually, TV series that started in Ireland this week, and it's based on uh, true events of uh, big drug gangs feud in, uh, in Dublin. Over, it's gone on over the last 10 years. But one of the big companies in America has picked up on this, and it's going to be airing over there. I, I can't remember exactly who it is, but I'll, I'll send it to you afterwards. But it's, it's, a, it's one of the big companies over there. So that's kind of what you're saying, is that maybe over here we don't see the shows that you guys see all the time. And over there, you don't see the shows that we have. But what you're saying is maybe this, the shows that are coming from different places around the world are kind of maybe starting to eclipse those being made in America. And we might Easily. see some. Yeah. So we might Easily. see a lot more. Because, yeah, because America is built on the American uh, entertainment industry, unfortunately, is built on personalities and the whole star cult. And, yeah. you know, and fascination with with. Uh, uh, titillation and uh you know exploitation and and who's your latest squeeze who's your latest color reality but, tv as well yeah and reality tv as well yeah. which is a, a big thing because reality tv doesn't ask people to, to suspend their Im imagination that much mm -hmm. what you see is what you get and and what you get is my ultimately uh, evolve into Oh, look, they do that too? Or that's what their life is like? It's a bit like a peeping Tom, you know, and, and it's, uh, it's, there's no storytelling discipline. And the storytelling, the reason why storytelling is so important to us, I believe. Now, the way stories are told may be changing, but I always imagine uh, two prehistoric men sitting by a fire in the middle of the night out in the prairie, in the middle of nowhere. All those animals are around there, all waiting to come eat them. And these two guys are pretty scared. They're shaking. Finally, one of them picks up a rock and he hits another rock with the rock. And it's causal. He made a sound with yeah. his hand. So he does it again. He does it again. That feels, that feels good. I like that. And the other guy grunts his appreciation. <clears throat> now you're 500 years in the future, a thousand years or whatever. And there's a family of, say, 10, 10 families all crammed into a cave because now they've learned how to live in caves. And they've all eaten too much saber to the tiger and they're too tired. Nobody wants to bang rocks and grunt. So they choose somebody to do that. And that person becomes the storyteller, the rabbi, the priest, the shaman. And what the story is doing is it's reaffirming not only our humanity, but it's reaffirming our ability to overcome our fear of death. It's, uh, it, it, it collects us as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a people and puts us in touch with each other so we don't feel so alone. That's a, that's a very important element. And when I say, you know, or anybody says that storytelling in America is either you know, changing to something unrecognizable or not, or falling apart completely, that's what the society and all of its ills is manifesting. It's losing its, its roots. It's losing its sense of history. It's losing its sense of a journey. And what do I want in this journey? And can I do something? Yeah. And instead, it's being replaced by, I don't know, what's around the world right now, which is a lot of helplessness and a lot of hopelessness. Uh, <clears throat> one of the things I wanted to ask you about the directing was when you worked with Arnold Schwarzenegger, what was he like to work with as a director? 
for the most part, Arnold was very professional. I would yeah. say he was very professional. You know, I mean, he understood this is what has to happen. This is where you have to stand. This is what you have to say. And this is what time you have to be there. You know, uh, he, he's, he, I don't think it's fair to, to compare him creatively to other performers. He doesn't yeah. function at that level. He functions on a, on a, uh, uh, a much more uh, uh, a simpler level, you know? How many curls do I have to do to make my biceps that big? You know? yeah, yeah. I want to look like, the, you know, like that. He's not the kind of guy that, that, that you know, says, how you feeling? You don't even get that with him. Uh, you know, it's uh, so, so, but he was professional. You know, he, he did his thing. Uh, you know, he's, uh, He's uh, he's a piece of work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All all his roles were very, were very similar, but very enjoyable at the same time. Like he's a true icon, really, as well. Um, well, I, kinda, I always kind of related to it, like the you know the the, uh, the the fat lady in the circus or the the woman with the bearded woman in the circus. It's like here's this person, their person, because they look like a person, but they also look like some kind of a creation. And do they really feel the way the same as I do and all of that? And what's it like to have a body like that? And, 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 and so you go along with that fantasy. Yeah. You know, and, and, uh, so, you know, I, I, just so you know, I directed that movie. I, I've been offered that movie by Rob Cohn, the uh, producer. And I had said, how long do you have to uh, prepare? And he said, two months. And I said, that's not enough time. And I passed. Mm -hmm. And they hired Andy Davis to direct it. Apparently he was a friend of Arnold's. And after two weeks, they fired him. And they came back to me and they said, would I take over the movie? And when I was directing, when I learned to direct on, on Starsky and Hunch, one of the things you learn in television is how to think on your feet and to be very adaptable and very fast and like that. So I had that ability. And so I said to them, I said, that was on a Thursday. I said, how long were you shut down for? He said, the Monday. <laughs> <laughs> Before two and a half months weren't enough time. And all of a sudden, Monday, I said, it was a win-win situation. You know, if I did well, if I put it together right and I and I did well, then uh, I get the credit. And if I uh, didn't, then Andy would get the credit. Yeah, yeah. Or the blame, or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Well, it was a you know it was an interesting puzzle. I'd read a script similar to that, and so I, I was sort of interested in that whole world. Uh, uh, so I, I I had an affinity for that, but uh, it was. Uh, it was basically problem solving, which yeah. is what a lot of directing is. Camera directors always, you know, it's it's all problem solving because you're always racing the clock and you're always trying to fit twenty five pounds of shit into a five pound bag. <laughs> Pressure. The, the sun's going down. We're losing the light. We're losing the light. <laughs> Have you got to do many fan conventions? Because I seen a, a clip of you on uh, it was in Birmingham. I think it was a couple of years back at a. I don't do a lot of those. I, no. I haven't done a lot of those. I you know I probably do one maybe two a year. But uh, but you must get asked for tons and tons of them, yeah. Well, if you don't put your name out there, you don't get asked that much, and I I don't I don't I don't miss it. You know, it's a. Uh, it's a bit of a one-way street, you know. People are want an autograph, they want a picture, they want this, they want that, they want to shake your hand. And that's well and good, and I'm thrilled to do that. However, it's energy going out. And what I like is energy goes out, energy goes back. Yeah. So in the most simplistic way, you walk down the street, you say, hello to a pretty girl. It's just a little back. That felt good. 
Yeah. Uh, um, so, what can I tell you? I, yeah. I don't. I don't go out of my way to do. Yeah, it's just I. I do be talking to a lot of people on here from different worlds, and they it, this convention world just seems to be exploding and getting bigger in America. Now, obviously, with the pandemic, it was all shut down, but well, also coming back the, now again. The 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 context and the subject matter is not relevant. In, in other words, it's more about people wanting a piece of history, want a piece of memory, want a piece of that. And unfortunately, they can't, you can't have a one-on-one with all of them. You yeah. can't sit there and, 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 and share your thoughts and to a group of people. Uh, you know, it's, it's can I have a picture? Can I touch you? Can I hold your hand? Can I shake your head? Can I get an autograph? You know, can I say hello? Will you say hello to me? Yeah. It's not personal enough is kind of what you're maybe saying, is it? Right. Yeah. Yeah. In terms of the future and the plans that you have, where are you going to be focusing your attention on over the next year? I'll be finishing my next, the, my, the book I'm illustrating and editing right now, which is, you know, this is one of those things that uh, is a, like a labor of love. Uh, uh, I was in between drafts on my first book, Crystallia, The Source of Life. This is 10 years ago. Yeah. I was in between drafts. And I was walking my daughter's dogs and I saw a crow with a scrunched up claw. I thought, hookfoot. And I went back to my apartment and I sat in writing and I wrote 30 pages on how he got that name. And then the next day I was walking the dogs and I saw a one-legged seagull. And I thought, I walked closer to see, make sure it had one leg, you know, yeah. sleep over. Yeah. And I thought, peg leg. And then I wrote back, I wrote 30 pages how she got her name. And then before I know it, I was having the two of these people, these birds, meet. And each had been thrown out of their accustomed role in their society because of their injuries. And they meet and totally dislike each other. But circumstances throw them together, so they have no choice. As much as they try to get away from each other, they have no choice but to, uh, to uh, uh, survive together. And along their journey, they meet a parrot. And the parrot falls in love with the seagull. Okay. And the parrot says, you are the most beautiful seagull I ever seen. <laughs> and he's like carrot. And I ended up writing, you know, 380 pages. That was really interesting. That was fun. I closed it. I put it in a drawer. And then, uh, and this was back more than 10 years. Because about eight years ago, I took it out of a drawer. I had some friends over. And I said, let me read you something. I stopped reading. And I kept laughing. I thought, you know, this is not bad. This is pretty good. So then at some point, my son gave it to a friend of his who said, who's successfully authored a number of children's books. And she came back and she said, oh, it's really lovely and everything, but I would simplify it and I'd make it more available for children, for young adults. Yeah. And yeah, to make a commercially successful book, I guess you would about three birds. But I'd had the same conversation with Cristalia and the Source of Light. And I didn't really want to, dumb it down in me. I didn't want to simplify it more. A lot of my humor is, uh, is uh, you know, ironic humor, and whimsy, and, and, you know, and I like that these birds were able to have an experience or even act in that way. So I am functioning under the, uh, the uh, notion if people are at all interested in this book it's probably going to be a robert livingston seagull yeah kind of phenomenon where we write a a, a, an, a young adults book for adults and when and you think Christa- yeah Christalia is i wrote it for people in you know, a best case scenario to take down from the shelf on christmas because it takes place christmas eve 
take down from the shelf and read it aloud to and with the family because it's about so much of the stuff the family is about. So who knows? I could be beating a dead horse and I could, you know, but I, I, one of the things I became very impressed with over my career was that finishing is everything. We all understand that at some point. You know, it's enough to have a good idea, but you got to finish it. Yeah. And so uh, I have been like a dog with a bone. I'm going to finish this kind of hard work. <laughs> <laughs> and when do you expect it to be out? Well, I don't expect anything anymore. I'm humbled by the process, but I would like to think that it's within view. <laughs> it's <Yeah>. within vision. <laughs> Paul, it was an absolute pleasure to talk to you today, and thanks a million for coming on the show. It's an honor. Oh, thanks for having me, and give my regards to all your fans, and give my love to Ireland. Thanks, Paul. <laughs>